Hey, everybody. I'm Frank Fear. Greg is not here tonight. Hello, Greg, wherever you might be. Uh, you're on Mountaineer Locker Room tonight, and I'm so pleased you're taking the time to join us. Great show. We're going to talk some basketball, uh, big news on campus today, and we're also going to talk about our feature story going back in time, given the subtitle of the show, Then and Now. We're going to do the then and that incredible, 1970 rather, uh, Pitt, West Virginia game, and we have two guests with us, and so we're excited to have you here. And without further ado, what I'm going to do is bring in my sidekicks, Daryl Prue. You all know Daryl, Mickey Plumley, and Shane uh, Stone Wolfley. Uh, as I was telling the guys, I shouldn't have been drinking so much before the show. It was all water, <laughs> but I get bloated, and it's it's a problem. So at any rate, what am I calling you, Shane? For Stone, that's terrible. In fact, I can't even read it. So uh, great to have you all here. So how are you all doing, by the way? Great. Nikki, it's, you a, doing great, okay? it's a great it's a great day to be a mountaineer, no matter where you may be today. That's absolutely. Isn't that true? And Stone, yeah. you, you've been working hard all day, so we appreciate your coming in tonight. How are you doing? Well, Stone is Stone. Oh boy. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna remove Stone, and hopefully he'll be able to come back in. Uh, but uh, the big news today, guys, obviously, uh, is what happened uh, with the basketball program. Just an incredible uh, game against Cincinnati yesterday in the tournament. Sixteen point lead uh, evaporated very quickly in the second half with uh, three tos technicals very quickly in succession, and uh, what we had hoped. Uh, would be uh, uh, an incredible win, given the fact Cincinnati won by, I think, 36 up in Cincy. Uh, they, uh, that doesn't happen, and West Virginia lost uh, by five. And today, uh, not unexpected, I think, Darrell, we'll start with you. Uh, Ren Baker, Baker announced that the, uh, that the head coach, uh, Josh Eilert, and the staff have been removed and that a national search has started for a new basketball coach. So, Daryl, your take on the circumstances? Yeah, I think they're trying to get rid of everything uh, Bob Huggins right now. Um, usually you'll keep the staff until they hire the new the head coach and until he brings everybody in. They usually, you know, use that transition there. But I guess they're just wiping and cleaning and everybody cleaning out the house. You know, he either has someone or he just just getting rid of everything Bob Huggins. Yeah. Well, you know, and and uh, I want to get uh, want to get Stone's take on this uh, in a second. When you when you think about the circumstances around the Huggins departure, and you think about the fact that Josh didn't have head coaching experience, really not even assistant uh, in terms of coaching experience, and and none of the guys uh, that he brought in as assistants did either, because they're all young, really. Uh, it, it, this looks to me to be a win-win situation. My guess is they're going to be picked up somewhere. And this opportunity they had, even though it ended up with uh, with 23 losses, um, you know, it's uh, we just have to swallow hard and say, hey, sometimes these things happen, but that there are some benefits to certain people. And I think I think those guys are going to uh, are going to land on their feet. Mickey, yeah. what are your thoughts? Well, you know, certainly disappointing, but uh, kudos to Josh and the job that he did. I mean, just coming out of the blue without, as you mentioned, uh, Frank, any, any head coaching experience or, you know, a magnitude of assistant coaching experience. And, you know, the fact that he, you know, kept the faith and he did all that he could do within the confines of the circumstances within which he, he was charged to operate, real feather in his cap, I think. And, you know, 9 and 23, not something that you have fond memories of. But, hey, who'll ever forget that went over Kansas in the uh, Coliseum that day, huh? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And let me uh, all extend, all of us extend to Kelly McCourt. Happy birthday. Um, the, the tremendous uh Supporter of the program, Kelly. So God bless you and happy birthday uh, to you. Uh, yeah, I agree. And in fact, uh, today in the presser, I don't know how many of you had a chance to, to watch that or listen to it. 
Uh, he, that's exactly what uh, A.D. Baker said, that, that if you look at how he comported himself and how he stepped up, it was really, uh, it was exemplary. And so that's the other thing I would say. You'll have to look at people and how they uh, comport themselves under times of stress. And uh, he certainly did. And so um, your thoughts, more thoughts on it, Daryl, what do you think is going to come next? I mean, it's, I thought, you know, they, they, it, it was a lot thrown at them. Um, and then you had to hire a bunch of new people. You wasn't allowed to keep uh, uh, Everhart, you know, some experience. And you hired, you know, three guys that didn't have any assistant experience. And he only had one year's assistant experience, even though he's been, you know, director of operations for a long time. And, you know, it's, so you, you got you hit the door running and then you have the guy coming to the, to the games and he probably was coming to the practices. So it was just, you know, he, he wasn't set up to, to win. You know, he was set up just to get through the year. You know, they got through the year. They competed for a while. You know, just some games is unfortunate. You know, uh, I think some people were misled by the talent. You know, I don't think they were overly talented. I mean, they had good talent, but they wasn't overly talented, at, you know, um, to win the Big 12. Um, you know, in the Big 12, you need a couple of pros uh, to to really win. Um, or everybody's playing together. And, you know, sometimes they didn't play together. Sometimes they didn't defend together. So, you know, it was a lot of different things. But he had to he had to work. Uh, I'm talking about Josh had to work the PR part, the fan part. Mm-hmm. Not even the he didn't get a chance to do the coaching part because he had so much other stuff and he had to work, uh, you know, as a head coach that, you know, he probably had a whole lot of sleepless nights, you know. So, yeah, no, I agree. Sad. I agree. It's sad. Hopefully, he, you know, he gets another job, but it's sad that, you know, it, it didn't put another enough people around him. Like, if, Say if I get the job, I'm hiring two guys that has a lot of experience. One yeah. probably a former head coach, and I'm gonna say, hey, I'm gonna hire Coach Kelly as my consultant. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Just, to, just to have, you know, just to have experience because you're gonna run into things that they've been through, and you can bounce it off of them without stressing about it. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, if you have a chance, uh, John Antonic, who was on the show last week. Uh, who writes, uh, obviously, is employed by West Virginia uh, Sports Content, Senior Director of Sports Content, had a really good article in WVU Sports today. He covered the uh, press conference. And I thought that he did a great job of putting the past in perspective and what happened and why, and why uh, Ren Baker really didn't have a choice. He he made the choice he had to make. But also, I thought... uh, both John and, and and Ren are very good at their jobs and both did a good job. John in print and, and Ren uh, in front of the camera of uh, describing what comes next. And it was d- said very subtly or not in a, you know, a pounding the desk way, but he said, we really got to start building a program, not a team. Uh, and that's a way of saying the portal has a place, but the portal can't be the primary entry, I can't, you can't build a program, right, around a portal. And yet what he also said was the next coach has to be one who is, uh, using my words, sort of consummate uh, with the use of the portal. You can't deny the portal, so you have to be able to use it. But like uh, everything in balance, and I think that's what he said. And and I, I'll, I'll stop with this. One of the things that, uh, that John said last week is, he said, uh, we're really in good hands with Ren Baker because he has a basketball background. And he says, you can't imagine the number of coaches around the country who look for institutions where the AD is a basketball person when there's a basketball search. I'm sure the same thing goes for football. And so uh, um, he's going to use his connections. And he has them. Uh, and uh, what I expect is that um, West Virginia may not likely, given the budget situation, end up with a quote unquote name coach, uh, but likely will do what they did several years ago, uh, bringing in coach Brown in football. And that is a person who's been successful elsewhere at maybe a group of five school uh, or a lower level power five school, and then hand the basketball to him. But what do you guys think, Mickey, Daryl, does that make any sense to you? Yeah. um, I've been saying it for a year, you know, about, I know you heard me say it with Dale that, that there's just a team every year. It's like an AAU team. 
when you go through the portal. You know, it's like you got to get these young guys and, you know, you got to have, you know, all the other successful teams still uh, recruit the younger guys, you know, so, but you got to use a portal as, as well. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as the coaching thing, I think there's a number of good coaches out there. Uh, you know, West Virginia's a, a unique place. Um, so, you know, the fans is, you know, we can't, you know, they, hopefully they win more than nine games next year. But they're starting over. You know, you got to understand. It's like it's it might not be zero players at the end of the season. You know what I mean? So now they got to build again through uh, high school and through, you know, the junior college and the portal. So it's going to be like it was the last two years. And That's right. you know, I give it time. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a two, three, maybe four year uh, thing where when they get it back together, rolling as a, as a, uh, as a, uh, as a program, you know, not just a team, you know, Catley had a program, Beeline built the program again, mm-hmm. hugging it off as a program. Then all of a sudden when the portal came up, everybody thought you had to go to the portal to get the older guys. And some teams like used like Michigan had a good year. I remember Hunter Dickinson's first year, but Hunter Dickinson was a freshman. Yeah. He got two good portal guys. And they were lucky to have those two because, you know, they fit in. You know, a lot of the portal guys are not fitting in. They just, you know, one is for the money. Two, they, they're either lower level guys that's trying to move up to higher levels. And there's a big difference playing, you know, Big 12 than it is playing in any NEC conference. So it's no no offense to them, but it's a big difference. Um, but it's, it's it, you know, it's going, the fans are going to have to have some patience because it's whoever, I don't care what name they bring in here, they're still going to have trouble, you know. They may win more games, but it's still not going to be what, you know, all the expectations are as far as winning. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, on this portal stuff, and I, Mickey and I have talked about this. Of course, it didn't They did. It didn't exist when you were playing for the Mountaineers. But, you know, take, take a look at Jose Perez, who came in from the East Coast and had to, was dismissed by, which really took a lot of courage. He was a prime guy, dismissed by uh, Josh Eilert. And then he transferred to Arizona State. Well, I don't know if you've you've heard this or the fans have heard this. Uh, he did fairly well, I think, really well at Arizona State. Was in double figures, and he quit the team before the before the Pac-12 tournament and to play pro overseas. And so I'm not criticizing him or singling. Well, I am singling him out, but I'm just saying you've got to be very careful when you do the portal that you you bring in not only people who can play basketball, but people that. Uh, can give you some stability uh, over time. But, you know, we'll close with this, Mickey. I think this is a very similar situation to WVU football. In 1965, sort of the bottom came out. And in 1966, uh, when Carlin came in, he wasn't going to build a team. He was going to build a program. Uh, and it took a while, uh, took, took a couple of years to get sea legs you could see the progress each year, and then, you know, you really hit pay, pay dirt starting in 1968 and then 1969 with the Peach Bowl. Uh, and I think Daryl's right. We've got to be patient. This is not going to be an overnight overnight construction. But I don't know if you – it just reminds me very much of that of, of that transition to Carlin in 66. You know, it does to me uh, as well, Frank. And uh even to some extent to uh, Coach Bowden taking over the, the realm as a head coach in 1970. You know, uh, a lot of people may have seen his press conference, Coach Bowden's press conference when he was appointed head coach. And he said he'd been asked what he was going to change. And he said he wasn't going to change anything with the program because you don't change a winner. Well, now we're almost in an exactly opposite situation here, as Daryl pointed out, that we've got to take some time. Again, as Jim Carlin did when he came in the 65, 66 era, you've got to get your program in, you know, your methodologies, your beliefs, and you've got to get the buy-in of the players. And, Daryl, okay. maybe you can speak to that just a little bit. But in addition, to you don't just put a program in and get immediately get immediate buy-in uh, to it. Right, Daryl? I mean, yeah. It takes a while for players to say, "Hey, this can produce a winner for us," and I'm I'm all in, coach. Yeah. So I, I, uh, when I went to Georgetown, we was in transition. We came from uh, it was from Big John Thompson to Craig Eshert to Little John Thompson, and it was a, it was a transition. And the buy-in, you know, the first the group kind of the guys that was there before we had, and we had a younger group, so we had a mixture of talent 
were freshmen and the older guys. You know, the first year was okay. Second year, sweet 16. You know, the guys bought in, like you said, Mickey. And, you know, and I was saying thing about Morgan State, you know, went from the first year we, you know, we won the regular season, lost in the, um, we lost in the uh, MEAC tournament. Then the next year we won the MEAC tournament, beat Maryland, uh, ended up playing in the NCAA. And it's the buy-in, you know, the buy-in. I think one of the mistakes, I'm not sure, I can't say this 100%, as, and, and what you said, what Ren Baker said about building a program, you know, those, you know, I think, you know, in, in recruiting, you can get lazy. And what I mean by you could go by the portal and just look at the portal and see who's out there. Oh, he got good numbers. But then you don't call the coach, the, the coaching staff, and ask what kind of person he is. You don't call the sure. high school coach. You don't call the AAU guy. So you get lazy before yeah. you, before that's what everybody do. You know, this staff is not that sa- you know, savvy enough to, to go out there and, you know, and ruffle the bushes and have contacts like that. And while you're there this year, bring in players. Like I brought in the the seven footer. You just bring in players so that sure. you can see that you're trying to build a program, and that may want to help your cause a little bit. But you know, yeah. you know, you can't wait until the season over and all of a sudden you're just looking in the portal every day. That's, that's right. That's been uh, late. You know what I mean? No, you just and this can't do that. This this past summer, and in December, we have a called DC Live. It's a live NCA event. And I see Kansas State here. I see everybody else here but West Virginia. You know, I just go because – and I sit with the coaches and I might wear a West Virginia shirt. You know, and just the kids don't know. You know what I mean? But that's a problem. And it's three yeah. hours away. Kansas State can recruit a kid from this area, you know what I mean, and be here with four guys on their staff or the, the head coach, the assistants. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that that has to change. You know what I mean? There's yeah. a lot of Division One talent because it was teams from out of town that was here in December, and there's nobody here to, from West Virginia. And, and that's the things you have to do. And, you know, when Larry Harrison was there in, as assistant coach, he was down here all the time, you know, yeah. asking me, you know, what players should I look for? What players should I look for? And I'll send him a list of names. He asked me, yeah. have you seen a player? Can you go see that player for me? That's yeah. the relationships you have to have and the experience in other cities. Yeah. And you know, and your staff have to it has to have that because even even for kid calls not that good and wants to come for an official, let him come. You don't ever know how good he is. He might get somebody else. He, he might tell you about somebody else, and that's the savviness of the staff that you didn't have because they were so young. You know, so yeah, you know, not young in age, just young in the in the game in, in the yeah, game. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's putting up a. Uh, uh, a chart here, guys, that uh, uh, you see if I can get you guys over there. And I'm going to try to pull this off here, too, so that we can see you all. There we go. Uh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> now that the season is over, uh, talking about building programs, here is uh, a chart. And we're going to go into more detail next week because we're going to focus on Gail Catlett, the Catlett era, uh, because he was coached for so long and he built a program. Uh you know, people, we generally have short attention spans. But if you look at that, Gail Catlett uh, was coached for 24 years, and he has played 100, the, the numbers in red uh, are the number one on this list. Uh, 720 games played, uh, over 400 games won. Uh, and uh, the only one that has a red next to the number, we talked about him last week, was Fred Chouse who took the Mountaineers to the champion NCAA championship in 1959 at 80%. But you, what's interesting about all those guys on that list, the top five, top four, um, five, uh, is the fact that they're around 60%, 62, 63%, uh, except for, for Shouse, that's that's 80%. And, and I was mentioning to one of our guests tonight, Dave Havern, who's going to be with us later, that uh, that was the heyday for WVU basketball, 1955 to 1965, with uh, Fred Schaus and then George King, who went on to Purdue. And then Schaus eventually, after the Lakers and after he coached at WVU, went to, uh, went to Purdue. But uh, we'll talk more about that and get into all the mechanics of uh, why uh, Catwood was successful. And, of course, Daryl played during that, uh, that period, and he can speak firsthand. We're going to talk a lot more about – about uh, Daryl's uh, career too. So 
Let me uh, get, get this back over here. Super. So now we're going to make a transition, guys. Uh, and in fact, I'm glad, Mickey, you brought up uh, Bobby Bowden because uh, the, uh, the mea culpa, so to speak, that Bobby mentioned after the 70 uh, game against Pitt probably wouldn't have uh, played uh, that second half the way he did with the strategy uh, had he had more experience as a head coach, but be that as it may. So what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a video we've put together that includes uh, a, a long interview with Greg joins me in it with uh, with the two quarterbacks of that day, uh, Dave Havern, who's going to be with us later, who is the quarterback for Pitt, um, and then Mike Sherwood, who is the quarterback for West Virginia. and West Virginia have been playing football since 1895. But these two old arch rivals never played it like they did on October 17, 1970. A homecoming crowd of 45,000 turned out for one of the most incredible comebacks of all time. With quarterback John Hogan on the shelf, Dave Havern drew the starting assignment. It was a game Havern will never forget. The game begins with West Virginia's high-powered offense practically blowing Pitt right off the field. The Mountaineers take a quick 14-0 lead. Then they make it 21-0. But West Virginia keeps pounding, and it's 28-8. And then, unbelievably, it's 35-8. The score is West Virginia 35, Pitt 30, with enough time to pull off the impossible. Here come the Panthers. Second down, seven at the West Virginia 43. He's handing off to Denny Ferris, cuts the corner, over the 40, knocks out of bounds, but up to the 38-yard line. Here come the Panthers now, high formation. Tavern fakes to Ferris. He's passing for a spot. Oh, he's got him at the 25. Out of bounds at the 21. Pitt at the West Virginia 21-yard line. Havert handing off to Ferris, trying to get wide, turns the corner and gets over the 20, down into about the 17-yard line. Havert gives off to Ferris, he bucks into the center of the line, gets down to about the 15-yard line, maybe the 16. Three minutes in this football game. Havert gets to Garnett, he battles his way forward, but not enough for the first down. Fourth and one for Pitt at the West Virginia 12. Havert to his positive. the 10. Let's wait and see if it's received. No! A signal from the official is yet. They're calling for a measurement. They're bringing the six in. On this decision hinges the outcome of this football game, ladies and gentlemen. They made it! First down, Pitt! First and 10 for Pitt at the West Virginia 11. To Denny Ferris, over the right side and through for a couple of yards, down to about the 8. 35 to 30, West Virginia. Pitt with the football. Taking it in to about the five, it'll bring up a third and four for Pitt. Big play, Moyer wide to right, Havern's going to pass. He's throwing, touchdown, Pitt, they will walk on it. The Panthers have tapped out an amazing comeback. They're ahead and Havern was hurt. Havern is stretched out on the field as the Panthers have gone ahead, 36 to 35, in an unbelievable football game, ladies and gentlemen. And who would believe it? West Virginia leading 35 to 8 at halftime. Pitt is going to win this football game with a great second half comeback. It's all over. The final score is Pitt 36, West Virginia 35. Well, we welcome all of you to a very, very 
special segment of tonight's show. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have uh, two of the principals, Greg and I, two of the principals from the 1970 West Virginia Pitt game, historic game, uh, one of the biggest comebacks in college football history, certainly then, and still it's on the list. Uh, and we have the two quarterbacks, Dave Havern from Pitt and Mike Sherwood from WVU. And uh, Greg, it's just so uh, wonderful to see these two icons and legends together. And one of the things that was amazing, maybe not so much when you think about it, is that uh, each of them would never be on the field um, when the other one was on it. So uh, they're actually, uh, would it be fair to say meeting for the first time today? <laughs> I, I would guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We had a lot of guests on where two people were on and one was the runner and the other was the tackler, but uh, that's that's not the case here. So, uh, but I think one of the things that might be important, and, and Greg knows this, uh, because the theme of the show is then and now, so part of our function on the show is to really, really, I think, inform people about the history of college football, in our case, specifically West Virginia, and in this case, the connection to the backyard brawl, but uh, to introduce yourself so that uh, so that those who uh, uh, are unfamiliar or were alive even uh, during the game, but follow the teams now, uh, will will get to know you. Why don't we start with our with our guest for Pitt, Dave? Uh, provide a, a snapshot of your background. Well, thanks first. First of all, it's nice to be here. It's a uh, it, it's it's I got you know is is. 90 miles away and rivalries make us it's still you have a warm spot i don't i don't know if mike does for us but 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 certainly the you know pit me that i the the you know i always have a fondness for mountaineers i know a lot of them uh you know banged into it. my brother-in-law tom sikowski made a whole lot of tackles for you guys at linebacker over the years uh but but yeah but it's it's nice to be on the show i appreciate you thinking about us it's only been 52 years ago that mike and i were doing this stuff so <laughs> And we're still doing a lot of it. But yeah, I got, I got out of coach for a while in college. I coached at IUP for a few years and then uh, got into business, uh, ended up being a head coach at Shadyside Academy, a, a WPIL school, but a, but a private school. And uh, did that, retired about seven years ago from that, still coached the quarterbacks out there. Um, got the four good grown up kids and going on 14 grandkids. Uh, wow. so yeah, that's kind of cool. You know, coached and enjoyed the heck out of that and still coaching. And uh, uh, actually got the coaches and somebody you guys might be aware of. I don't know if you ever heard of this kid, Mark Bolger. He, he had a little bit of success. <laughs> I, uh, the, I think we have. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, so actually he was, he was my third NFL quarterback. Well, once, you know, at Georgia Kites when I was coaching at IUP, had a couple of years with the Jets and then Mark. And then we got a kid now that played quarterback for me technically at, uh, at the shady side, Sky Moore. He's playing slot for the Kansas City Chiefs now. And uh, he's, he's pretty good. I was a real good coach when I was coaching those. <laughs> and I, I, I was a much better coach. Great. Before we get to Mike, I will, you mentioned Tom Zikowski, who lives down in Lexington, Kentucky area. Yeah, just moved back. I, I heard something the other day from a friend, a mutual friend of mine, a fellow by the name of Steve Baker, who also is from originally <laughs> the Pittsburgh area and then from Kentucky, that he said, you know, uh, uh, Tom Zakowski, who he knows, he said, that's that's Dave Haveron's brother-in-law. So here's the question. Uh, I looked at I looked at the stats the other day from the 1971 West Virginia Pitt game. Okay. About the 70 game here. Yeah. But in 71, you came to Morgantown yep. and West Virginia got revenge, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was Tom Sikowski, who hadn't played a lot, mm -hmm. intercepts a pass. Yeah, it wasn't me. <laughs> Boy, that was, that was it quick. Was, <laughs> no, no, wasn't, wasn't me. It was it, there, there's an interesting story about that. You know, and I don't want to, I don't, you know, I know we you know, want to talk to Mike too, but, but that game, that, 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 uh, I think it was 13 to nine. That's right, it was. And, here, and, and, and it was the year after the other game. But so, and, and, uh, we had the ball on R2, and Bobby Kazeel was our center. And he, he was the first center drafted that year, played for the Saints, and played for the Skins for a long, long time. Had a real droll sense of humor. So we're running out onto the field, and we got 98 yards to go in about eight minutes. And he looks at me and says, Steve, we win this one. They'll be talking about you forever. You know. <laughs> so we get out to about, about the 50, and we're moving the ball. And I'm running, and I'm throwing. We got a pass, and I throw a little swing pass to a kid. 
and uh, I get hit, and I think it was Billy Joe Mantooth. I mean, I, you know, I think it was oh. Billy. You know, God bless him. And and I slide down, and I said, Ah, hell, I can't, I can't move my shoulder. We ran into the locker room in the old stadium, which was the greatest place in the world. I mean, God, like you know, that wish, you know, the new one's beautiful, but man, there's something like Morgan Mountain near field. Anyway, we were running. It was back in the day. It's better living through chemistry, you know. And so, <laughs> so, so, so our our team gives me the first one and. I got nothing, you know, and he gives me another one. He said, I got nothing. I said, what are we looking for? He says, you're looking for like a little electric shock. And he gives me the next one. And man, it, it flops up. And I go, oh, that's good. <laughs> and we come running out and there's all kids are sitting in the, they're standing in the end zone, which is just great, great atmosphere. Just as it, and it was Bobby Medwood, another kid from McKee's Rocks, throws it to Zeke. And I just look, I said, Phew. It wasn't me. It belongs to me. It wasn't me. Yeah, there you go. Well, I'll tell you, uh, Mike, welcome to the Dave Patton Show here. <laughs> go ahead, Mike, uh, your background, please. Yeah, I, I'm originally from Bel Air, Ohio. It's where it's where I'm living now. I, I moved back here so, uh, a little over 40 years ago. But uh, when I got when I finished playing, I stayed for three years as a uh, grad assistant at WVU, and then I, I coached for six years at Bethany College and Waynesburg College, and then I came back home here, and uh, during the 35 years I was here, I, I was the head football coach for a few years, and then I was the athletic director, and then I spent uh, oh, 20, 21 years in uh, administration as an assistant principal and principal, and retired from that, and then actually went back and uh and worked for four years and just rec uh, as the athletic director again they asked me to uh, come back to the school and i did and uh worked until uh, two years ago and I, I i retired retired finally officially two years ago and uh like dave I, i've got uh, i've got two kids i've got a daughter that graduated from wvu and a, a son that graduated from ohio state i have five grandchildren and uh, um, I'm back here where it all started. Yeah. Wow. What great memories. And, and you guys weren't in the same class. Uh, Mike, you graduated after the 70 season. And Dave, uh, you played, was it 70, 71? I and sure you did, Mike, in 69. So, Mike, you were, were you a freshman in 67, Mike? In, yes, in 67. Yeah. We okay, came yeah, in, so we yeah, were the, yeah. We were the same. That was before freshman because we played down in we played you guys open or down in Aliquippa or Aliquippa down in yeah. Beaver Valley. You know, I think so. Yeah. So so my our sophomore years were con, you know congruent, and then I had mono going into the '69 season. So so they sure I got shirted then. So mm -hmm. so yeah. So I I Mike finished up playing in '70. I finished in '71. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so Mike, yeah. you weren't the quarterback in that '71 game then. No, no, okay. okay, no, no. That would have been Bernie Gallipa, uh, who I played with in Wheeling. You know, with yeah, uh, and Kirchner and Ox and Desmos and those guys. And All those guys, yeah. That yeah. was great. I, I sit here and I, I want to tell both of these guys, uh, you know, what a pleasure this is for people like me. Uh, I know Frank, uh, when when you wrote the book, uh, got me involved with a lot of these guys who played back then. I vaguely remember these games. I watched them. I was only nine or ten years old. No offense, You're guys. But, years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but I do I do remember bits and pieces, and I've watched a lot of film, and it is it is so much fun to hear all these great stories and and these reflections. And I I just can't tell you how much we appreciate both of you. I'd say that uh, we you know I've, I'm sure Dave feels the same way. Uh, we're appreciative of just being remembered at this point. Yeah. You know. Oh, and, uh, yeah. and I'm not sure how many people out there listening. Are, are actually going to have any recollection of his playing? There'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of Google action, Mike. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, that's right. <laughs> plus, that's right. Film, plus, the film's in black and white too. So, I, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know, and, and, and I know Greg shares it with me, and I said it a bit before. Uh, there's so much focus on what's going on. You know, we're going to have spring practice pretty soon for both schools, and seasons right around the corner. And WVU is opening up big home game against Penn State uh in the end of august but you know there's a history to all of this that is is not only so much fun but it's very informative uh in terms of you know what's going on in the world uh you know we were talking we were talking earlier that 
that uh, the game we're talking about today, the 1970 game, uh, Dave had a repeat the following year against Navy that ended up a big comeback that ended up to be the same exact score, 36-35 pit. And, you know, that's what's what's the what are the possibilities of that? But the bottom line is that it's I think it's important for people to know. And it's I think it's, uh, you know, especially for the younger fans. And so they really appreciate the people because we all stand on the shoulders of others for Pete's sake. We know that. Yep. Well, let's put the 1970 season in perspective. Uh, and uh, each of you could talk about what was what, what your thoughts were going into the season. The, the game we're going to talk about was, uh, it was in October. Again, well, let's start with you, Dave, in terms of the pit season, because you started out uh, reasonably well with the opener. I think it was the opener to UCLA, but then went on a winning streak uh, before Mountain News came to town in October. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was a, it was. Um, I was breaking in a new coach. <laughs> we, we we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Carl DePasqua, God bless him, and uh, but they came in '69, the year I was redshirted, so they didn't know me you know and 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 so it was that we were fighting I, there was like a three-way battle for the job you know so it's like you had that on my mind and then um just you know got got edged by ucla at home uh and then one the, the i think the west virginia game was the fourth straight we beat miami the next week and we had been very good i mean it was you know the, the dave hart the guy who recruited me and you know we was three and 27. You know, so that was, you know, that the last year was my sophomore in 68 and 69 was Carl the Pass was first year. And they they were maybe three and seven. I think we were still playing 10 games at that time. And probably the reason I got to play the whole West Virginia game is because John Hogan, the guy was the primary, you know, my primary competition twisted his knee down at Navy, like in a 10, eight game. So, so I probably wouldn't have made the second half because the first half was so bad for me, you know, and things like that. So we were, we were like five and one, not used to being five and one was rarefied air, uh, beat Miami the next week, I think to go five and one and you get ranked for the first time in maybe 10 years or something like that, but at a cost of like really, you know, just, uh, attrition. We had, tight ends playing linebackers and guards playing fullback it was really we got and I think we lost the last four so we ended up you know so it wasn't you know it was a it was a turnaround but there was a couple or three you know nice weeks where we were on a roll well, just to, Greg it was a flip for West Virginia Mike you know obviously you guys won the Peach Bowl uh the year before uh Bobby Bowden was now the coach uh you had come off uh really and I was there the uh, big upset against against Duke uh, the week before, and so right, yeah. So talk about how you guys were thinking going into the nineteen seventy season, and then your thoughts, particularly after the Duke loss, going into the pit game up at Pitt Stadium. Yeah, we we were very optimistic going into the season because we we had a lot of our we had a lot of our people back. Uh, we we were missing some. Uh, really good players too, uh, but but we we were very optimistic. Started off, I, I think we won the first four or something like that. Can't remember exactly how many. And then the the Duke game was uh, was a, a a real downer for us, you know. Uh, and uh, interesting fact there that was that that was the last time I think that the players ever stayed on campus the night before a game. Because we 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 were all still staying in the dormitories then, and um, uh, all the football players we all lived at towers, and uh, in the middle of the night they pulled a fire alarm and they they evacuated the buildings, and so we we stood outside the night before the Duke game for about an hour and a half I think uh, in the middle of the night, and of course when you got a game the next day it's it's a little tough to get back to sleep and all, and so. You know, the whole thing was just kind of out of whack. And then they, they they stopped us one time down on the goal line uh, on a fourth down play and kind of turned the game around. And we lost that. And so, you know, it was a little bit of a downer. But then then we went into the pit game. And, you know, we were we were certainly very confident going into the game. Uh, but uh, the, the result of that game, the result of that game really put us in a funk. And we didn't we didn't play great for the next couple of weeks. 
uh, we went to Penn State and just got slaughtered. And uh, that that was uh, that was a game that was unexpected because Penn State was not not so much the loss, but the way that it happened. Because Penn State, I think they were only like seven and three that year, something like that. And it, you know, it was kind of a down year for them. And then pro- probably the most rewarding part of the season was the last game against Syracuse because Syracuse had beaten both Pitt and Penn State uh, during the season. And our last game there, we, you know, we were we were able to come back and uh, and, and beat the, beat Syracuse in the last home game that year. And that 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 was probably the most rewarding part of that season. Yeah, when I hear these uh, hear these teams that they played, you know, and I, I think the whole time I was growing up, you know, those were the teams we played, and and uh, you know, then when the the Big East started and then fell apart, I mean, it's a whole new world now. And, I, and you know, my fondest memories as a Mountaineer fan uh, growing up was turning that radio on at noon on Saturday and listening to Jack Fleming. And that, that's, uh, you know, that's what we did. And uh, we love that. And I still miss doing that, <laughs> you know. And uh, I interviewed Tony Caridi one time and, and, and asked him about, you know, following in the footsteps of of Jack Flynn. Of course, he said that that can never be, that can never happen. I couldn't fill his shoes for anything. But, um, and I told him, it's just not the same. I love listening to him, Tony, but it's just not the same. And I I think my my fondest memories are listening to those games back, uh, back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s, just fantastic. And these memories that these teams that they played, it brings up, it does make you miss miss these rivalries and these Eastern games. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking, uh, Dave, as uh, Greg was saying that, uh, Ed Conway, we played with uh, yeah. yeah. from Ed Conway. You know, unfortunately, he passed away not too many years after that yeah. death, really, mm-hmm. with throat cancer. But what a voice when you think of Fleming and Conway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great voices you just don't forget. They're with you. Yeah. And then you have Bob Prince, of course. Oh, uh, and yeah. Iron Cope, and you yeah. keep on going and going. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these guys are legendary. Anyway, so um, you know, for those uh, who are familiar and those who are learning it today, it was a tale of two uh, uh, stories, really, uh, cities, so to speak, of that game. First half was all WVU. So I wrote in the book. I got my wife and I, Kathy, got there late. We're both WVU alums, so we got there late. And by the time we got there, it was twenty-one to nothing. I think it was uh, Eddie Williams that just scored another touchdown. And uh, and then before you know it, Braxton breaks away. Mike, you threw. It was a great play. And we've got it in the, the video that, that people have seen of you throwing that pass to Braxton as he breaks down the middle to score a touchdown with, I think, about 20 seconds left in the first half to make it 35 to 8. I know that oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, Braxton would come in and say something about I'm open and so on. Was that you? Was it Bobby Bowden? Was it, uh, was it how, how, how did that, do you remember how that play came to? It was just beautiful. Well, it, at that point, Co- Coach Bowden had gotten to the point where he and Coach Signetti had gotten to the point where they were pretty much letting me call plays. You know, of course, we, we certainly went over, you know, down and distance situations and places on the field and you know time score all those kind of things but uh, yeah that that was a play and 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 as i i recall uh, you know jim was tight end and on a lot on a lot of our on a lot of our passes at that point he was uh, he was he was our hot he, he ran a lot of hot routes for us you know uh, where we could throw the ball off of blitzing linebackers and i believe that may have been you know one of those calls where uh, the, the uh, linebacker blitzed, and we, we would just throw the dump to him then. So if you guys could talk about, uh, and actually in the book I have some descriptions of both the Pitt locker room and also the West Virginia locker room, and I know, Mike, uh, you told me the story about walking off the field with Bobby Bowden. So obviously the, the adjustments or changes were made during halftime uh, that carried into the second half. So, uh, Mike, what do we start with you this time in terms of, Take us through walking off the field and halftime and what you guys plan for the second half. Yeah, you know, obviously we had had uh, good success against them the two previous years. Uh, we, we we threw the ball against them a lot in uh, in 68. And then 
in 69, we ran the ball real well. And, and, you know, we, we, uh, we, we, I think it was like 38, 15 and 49, 18, something like that. And, you know, then we're 35, six at the half and, or 35, eight at the half. And I was walking off with coach Bowden. And like I told you, Frank, if, if old Pitt stadium was still there, I could take you to the spot where we were walking <laughs> off together. And uh, he said to me, he said, boy, you've, uh, he said, you've owned these guys uh, the last three years. And I said, well, for two and a half games, anyhow, coach, you know, just making small talk, not, not, not realizing that maybe I was going to be a prophet. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so that, that was, that was uh, the, the uh, situation you were talking about. And as I recall at halftime, you know, we really didn't make many adjustments. The only thing coach Bowden, had told me was first half our, our game plan against them was to to you know th throw a lot of bootlegs and to run the ball outside uh run, run our traps inside because they, they they were a big physical front and and we we, we had a we had a much quicker team uh offensively than their defensive team and so you know our 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 whole plan was to finesse them the uh, in that game, and that that's what we did the whole first half. And at halftime, Coach Bowden said, "Hey, look, uh, second half, let's just uh, you know just run the ball, run the dives, and let's uh, you know get the game over with." And of course, that's why if you ever talked to him, he he, he would have told you that uh, that that was one of the worst defeats, if not the worst defeat he ever had. And as a result. Uh, he, he said, I, I never took my foot off the gas again. And uh, I can remember a, a um, not a confrontation, but I guess a discussion between he and Lou Holtz uh, the, um, the next year, because Lou Holtz was upset that uh, they, they ran the score up on him. And Coach Bowden told him, he said, that's your job to keep the score down, not mine. <laughs> he said, I never called the dogs off after that. And so... What had happened too is they, you know, they they scored on a drive rate. They, they had they had a drive, and then when we came out the second half, they had a long drive and scored. And we went out and we ran three plays, punted, and they got the ball. And then they had another long drive. So our offense was off the field for a long time, a long period of time, counting the halftime. And then we tried to go back to what we were doing before, and couldn't get it going really until the last drive. And I, I think the game, the game ended uh, on a, on a pass when one of our receivers caught a ball and got hit and fumbled and they recovered and ran the clock out. And so, you know, from our, from our perspective, that, that, that's how, that's how everything went. You know, there weren't many adjustments or anything at halftime and they came out and ran the ball. And I, I think they ran 60 some plays in the second half. Yeah. WV only had 50. 15 plays in the second half. Years were driving, and I turned to Kathy. Still remember? I said, "We're going to come back and win this game." And uh, it was Wayne Porter, very reliable receiver, as you know, caught it, and he was hit. And he fumbled on the 36, I think. But yeah, uh, yeah. So it's like, wow. Mike, you know, Mike was being humble, and he, they owned us. I mean, it was there. We did could do nothing against them from from uh, from Mike and, and uh, Braxton and was it Eddie Williams? I think was a running yeah. back. Eddie team. Williams and Bob Gresham. Yeah, I mean, you guys were loaded. That was a good team, man. And then he was absolutely. But Mike said, "Yeah, they went outside. We were big up front. Yeah, we would have won the game in a phone booth. You know, you know, any fights. But yeah, but it was just we did nothing." nothing right at, at all we got you know and it wasn't it wasn't you know we the reason we weren't doing anything right is because west virginia was pounding us but but we went in at the half and uh, nobody was like real emotional nobody was down you know we'd been there before unfortunately you know but you know we, we were in a little bit of a streak at the time but you know, a lot of times we went in you know without the lead at halftime and it was just the only adjustment that the the coaches made, they said, "Okay, we're going to go to a power eye." They, you know, they, we were bigger and stronger than West Virginia, just personnel wise. So we went in and uh, and just no fiery speeches or anything like that. You know, just go out and, and play and just ran the ball and started to have some success doing it. Uh, didn't punt, which was huge because we you know, we probably punted four or five times in the first half. I don't think we had more than two first downs. You know, 
But uh, but yeah, it wasn't a, other than you know the adjustment, uh, and, which a lot of people talk about the offense. But but what you know to, to going back what Mike said, they, those he he wasn't on the field much. I mean you know and because we had such long drives on offense, but our defense it, it was suspect at times, and it, they stood up pretty strong, you know. And it was hard, like Mike, you know, like you said, he had been the offense. His offense had been off the field for about forty five minutes. When you looked at the half and then the first drive, I think because the four drives, the shortest drive was like 58 yards or something like that, you know, so and and I think we probably threw eight or 10 balls in the second half, didn't didn't throw a lot, you know, but uh, but yeah, it was just kind of used our physicality, uh, you know, converted some fourth and ones, you know, and things like that, you know, so there was you know, the fates, you know, were on our side that day, just, you know. We, you know, I don't think it was luck because we were playing hard, but, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we caught the ball well. We, you know, I, that's, I think I was one for four in the first half. I was terrible, but I think we were like 10 for 11 in the second half, you know, and, you know, so, so there was, it was complete, like, like change, but I don't, it wasn't a strategy thing or anything like that. It was, uh, um, just that we were bigger and stronger and we were able to hold the ball, you know? And uh, the funny thing about the last drive that Mike was talking about. So when we scored to make it 36, 35 and I got killed, I mean, I was playing, I'd missed, I I had a bruised sciatic nerve from, from uh, you know, and I missed the game before that. So I was in basically like a body cast and not moving, which probably helped because I stayed in the pocket, which, you know, one of my chief criticisms, I didn't stay in a pocket too long and they were probably right. But, but so I get KO'd on that last pass uh, uh, to Billy Pilconis, who God bless him, he's, he, he's passed too. And so I, you know, they ran out and kicked the extra point. And a lot of people did, did, did this went into play next year in that the other 36, 35 game you, you were talking about that, you know, you got to go for two, you know, you know, makes a three point game. So in the best in overtime, there were no overtimes in that time. Yeah. So when they were driving down, you know, people, oh, you know, this, this kid's close, you know, he's, you know, we're going to lose this game, you know, 38, 36, you know, and then that kind of what was what we felt it like at the end. But, but I said, it was just, you know, I don't think any, any major changes. We just like, you know, we were bigger and stronger than they were. And it was, you know, and just be able to keep them off the field. All, you know, all he would have needed was one drive, one good drive, and nothing would have happened. You know, so, so yeah. Yeah, you know, Greg, I was, I was thinking, obviously, with your years of experience as a as a basketball coach, the thing that uh, I'm sure everyone saw in the video clip uh, before this interview, uh, and I couldn't see it in the stands that day, was the look in the eyes of the West Virginia defense. Yeah. Uh, as West, as you guys kept on scoring, as Pitt kept on scoring, it was the hands on the hips. There wasn't much talking. Uh, and it's interesting because um, that it just, it, it, I don't want to say it was preordained, but there were, the, the, the psychology of it was not good. I'm sure you experienced that. What do you do as a coach when you see that? Can you yeah. do no, no, yeah. And you, and you mentioned that, uh, the psychology of it. Of course, I have a I have a brother who's a clinical psychologist. We've talked about that. And uh, yeah, you see that look in, in their face. Uh, like you said, the hands on the hips, indicative of a lot of things, the body language. Uh, you know, as a coach, uh, the only thing you could, of course, <laughs> I've seen it happen a lot of times where the coaches were the same way. <laughs> you know, they had the look in their face, uh, which is a bad sign. But, uh, you know, as a coach in the, in the, the times I faced things like that, you know, you just got to you just got to keep plugging and keep doing what you what you know you can do and what you're good at. And so many times, um, you know, like like Mike said, uh, Coach Bowles saying, well, you, you've owned these guys. Well, you know, that gets in the head of players when they're ahead 35 to eight or whatever it is. And they kind of let off the gas and they they change what they typically do. Uh, they start doing different things, and when you start doing different things, you're you're destined to fail uh, because you're not doing what you're what you're good at doing. So as a coach, you know you just try to make sure that you keep doing what you what you've always done. And you know one of the criticisms you'll hear today of of our coaches, uh, you know, he'll go for it on fourth and one from his own forty five or whatever. Uh, you know those those are things that if if you're made up to do those things, that's what you do. 
And if you start changing all these things, then uh, you're not going to be real successful. And I think just as a coach, you just get you just try to get them focused on the things that they're that they're doing well, the things they're good at doing, and keep doing those things. And like you said in that video, though, you can see uh, you can see the you know the hands on the side, the look in the face. Uh, you can see that. And uh, like I said, I've I've seen I probably had that look on my face before, but I've seen coaches with that look as well. And uh, yeah, not a whole lot you can do when that ball starts rolling downhill like that. Yeah, you know, and when you when you if you look back at the film, you see Leon Jenkins, number twenty one, Mike. Yeah, uh, actually uh, playing sort of a linebacker. He's up on the line a lot, uh, and and uh, Leon was a terrific uh, defensive back. The other thing, Dave, about that film that strikes me is that. You guys set up the comeback, the, uh, the comeback with terrific running off tackle. But when you pass the ball, you did a lot of passing to your running backs. Those running backs owned the, the day. There mm -hmm. were three of them. But I remember one on the film that we kept was a uh, 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 pass to Esposito that he was wide open, I think probably on a 15-yarder. And then that pass to Bill Balconis at the end, he mm -hmm. was wide open in the end zone on a third and four. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was just amazing how wide open he was <laughs> at, 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 as a tight end. Because we ran a pick, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you said that because we're going to submit. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> we're going to protest. We're going to protest. One of the things, Frank, that re really hurt us defensively that day was – you know the the real the the guy that the defense was built around was yeah, Dale Farley, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. he didn't get to play that day. And and yeah. you take that game and then you, you compare it to the Syracuse game that we played. And there's one point in the Syracuse game late in the game where we're you know they're they're going to score to go ahead, and they they've got the ball first and goal on like the three yard line, and Dale Farley made four straight tackles yeah. on, on on the goal line to uh to, to stop them and and so you know that that it, it, it's just one of those things where everything aligned uh, against us in that second half well in the years that uh, have passed uh this game doesn't go away in fact uh dave i had a chance a couple of years ago to listen to an interview you did on wtae i think it must have been eight or nine years ago uh for a, for obviously a pittsburgh audience talking about the game and with the book and everything, and obviously appreciate all the promoting work that Greg did, it still lives. And and yet, you know, we've all been involved in a lot of rivalries, and we know that there is, I think, you know, some some back and forth between Pitt and West Virginia, but there is also a lot of respect mm -hmm. uh, between the two schools and uh, maybe, and Dave and I were talking about this the other day. Maybe it's our sh shared, and I'll use the word disdain for Penn State. I don't. That's my thought. Why this? Yeah. This. Uh, and also, I might mention the 1989 game. It almost happened again. This time in Mountaineer Field, West Virginia. I don't know. Were you at that game? Does that ring a bell, uh, Greg? 89? Yeah. Yeah, there was uh, one where we were ahead 31 to 9, I oh, think. It and they come back and tied it at the, on a field goal at the end. Yes, I they, was there. Yeah, it's in, yeah. All in the fourth quarter. Yeah. And a uh, uh, field goal, I think, at yeah. the, uh, three or four <laughs> seconds, it's 31 31. Yeah, I, remember, I learned about that from our our, our uh, uh, good friend Dale Wolfley. Uh, and he, he was a junior, I think, that year. Yeah. And I went back and watched the film of that game. And it's just, how could this happen? So it almost happened again. Yeah, you know, you know Frank, that, that that particular game, uh, I I was back here in Bel Air at the time, and uh, I, uh, I I took uh, Joey Galloway played for us here uh, in Bel Air, and uh, oh. then went on to Ohio State and the Seahawks. And he was a senior at Bel Air at the time, and uh, I, I took him down to see that game, and uh, the, I, I I was there, and I thought, boy, I've seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> and you know frank you were, we were talking about the looks on the players faces and the and the uh, uh the coaches and all that being at a game like that it, it's also in the crowd you know in the fans you can feel it you can just feel the tension in the air and that night um yeah i remember it well we, we my buddies and i we had season tickets and went and uh, <laughs> when that second half started we were like 
man, it's just a, something's not right. <laughs> you just you can just feel it. So I said, I think that's even in the crowd too. So you wonder sometimes it's just not not meant to happen, you know. Yeah, and it's not just football. How many times yeah. it happened in basketball for oh, yeah. other sports yeah. as well? Yeah. Well, this this has been great, guys. Any final comments you want to make? Let's start with Dave, uh, and then Mike, and then we'll close with uh, with Greg. So, any final comments, Dave, as you reflect on the game and the the rivalry over the years? Well, but yeah, yeah. Well, again, thanks. This has been fun. It's been nice to finally get, to get a chance to meet Mike, and uh, you know, had a lot of respect for him over the years, but. But uh, I hope they can keep this rivalry. You know, <laughs> we were beset now, you know, with people like knocking down tradition. It's something that's, you know, over the years, you know, we grow longer in the tooth. And like I said, I got, you know, with Zeke and guys that I played with down in Wheeling and guys that I've run into over the years. And I'm sure Mike is the same way too. There was something about playing in, you know, for your home school and things like that. At it and then having a tradition of rivalries that are that are that are that are that are that are, that are harsh, bitter, but they're but they're still uh, you know a modicum of respect you know for each other and that you know and I think maybe because we're similar so, and and that's my concern you know is just coming to the end of my coaching career now and things like that I'm just watching I said you know this is ball you know and it really makes up for a whole lot of stuff you know that goes on and i think we're losing that and that, and that's a concern and i don't know if that's the 75 year old guy talking or if it's the guy that you know might for once in his life be right how important these games are and you know here we are mike and i were talking 52 years late, later like you know we just walked off the field you know and i think that that's an important thing not only for the guys who play, but for the people who go to the stands, people who follow the game. And that's, and that's you know, I'm a little sad at that. Yeah, it was, uh, you, you know, it, it was always a, a big thing to play against th these teams where, you, you know, at that time, you only really knew about the teams regionally. You know, we, I, we, we didn't know, like now guys, you know, they, they've been to camps together in the summer they mm -hmm. they've uh, ev everything's on tv everybody knows everyone we we only knew the guys in our little world you know and uh, i i know especially for the guys that we we had a lot of western pa guys there playing for us and i i know that pit game was huge for them you know mm -hmm. and uh and it, it and it, if you played at pitt or west virginia whether you had ever been part of it it became a big part of you, you know, that rivalry. And like Dave said, I, I certainly hope they can figure out a way to keep it going because it's a it's a great rivalry and it's a it's a fun rivalry. And I think it's one where, you know, although there's a you know a lot of um, competitive spirit, it's still it's still a friendly kind of rivalry and that people respect each other and and all. And of course, back then, you know, like Dave said, everybody was kind of local. And now, now the teams, you know, you look at the teams, the, the kids are from, from all over the country. And especially now with the portal, guys are coming in and going. And uh, uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I enjoyed the rivalry and I, I, I thought it was terrific. And like Dave, I, I really appreciate you guys having us on and uh, give, giving us a chance to uh, be remembered a little bit. Yeah. Well, we, wanna, we wanna thank you too, in fact, uh, we have a graphic that we're, we're showing uh, uh, on the show that fans voted who, who are the best, from your perspective, best quarterbacks at these two schools all time. And uh, Dave, you're in the top 20 and Mike, you're in the top 10. So there That's are people right. out there that that do remember and do respect. And you well know both of these schools have had some incredible quarterbacks. I mean, you had the passing record uh, until – a guy named uh, what was his name? Dan Marino, I think he played a little pro ball. Uh, yeah. Dan Marino yeah. broke the yeah. average yeah. yeah. record. I was just going to say thank you, both of you guys. It's so much fun to, to hear these stories and to relive this uh, this past year. Frank and I talked many times about legacies and trying to keep these these uh, legacies alive. You guys clearly uh, have left the mark on both your schools and, and each other's schools, for that matter. And uh, it's so important to keep these legacies alive. And you know, uh, we're talking about the rivalry and and you know how it really is probably a friendly rivalry. I never realized that. You know, I'm I'm from Southern West Virginia and uh, lived there my whole life. And we hate Pitt, you know. But 
Uh, I've been in Morgantown now for quite a while working. I live in, uh, during the week, I stay with my brother in Bridgeport, Ohio, which I think is pretty close to Bel Air. So, you know, you're, you're around a lot of people from Morgantown, uh, then in Bridgeport and Wheeling and all the way down through there. And you realize that we're all the same people culturally. I mean, it's just a, a like, a like person. And, and, uh, uh, I think that ri- that's what makes the rivalry, you know, a, f- a friendly mm-hmm. rivalry yet competitive. And I think it's important for us to do things like this to keep that alive and 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 to keep uh, people informed and to keep these legacies alive. I think it's so important for all of us. And uh, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure for me uh, to meet you, Dave, and and to talk to Mike again. It's uh, so much fun to listen to you guys talk about the past and and uh, to hear these stories. It's just, just super fantastic, and we appreciate you. Well, I can tell you personally, is my life is a lot richer. Uh, because of folks like you, no question about that. And I got the chance to meet all of you because of Mountaineer football. And so that that speaks there. So for Greg Christ, we really appreciate Dave and Mike being with us. And uh, that does it from here. We're joined right now by uh, a guy by the name of Mr. Bob Zatelli from the Keys Rocks, Pennsylvania. And I'll put a little information up here. Bob started at left guard in the 1970 pit game. And I was watching that number as he was clearing uh, the way for Gresham and Braxton and uh, and uh, Eddie Williams. Bob, thanks for joining us. It's great to be, uh, be heard, Frank. And, uh, I don't know if it's great, great uh, having us on the program this evening. Um, hello to my roommate, Mike Sherwood, and my childhood friend of Bob Dave. I'm trying to figure out probably Little League days. We go back yeah, more eight, yeah, nine, yeah. Nine, cool. <laughs> and uh, here we are, 74, 75, my brother. And we get a chance to see each other in a few more weeks once again. Yeah. Yeah, look well, forward to a, I got to put a plug in. Bob does a great job <laughs> fundraising for uh, scholarships in his hometown, uh, the Stowe Rocks area. And uh, and Dave's going to be the uh, keynote speaker. Uh, yeah. and Dave has asked me to write a speech. Uh, is that true? Somebody's got to help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want that. <laughs> Any rate, Mickey, you had a chance to watch this. Uh, Dave obviously was part of it yesterday, and Bob was. Before I turn to Bob, your thoughts about uh, about the video and that uh, what these guys uh, had to say. Well, I'll tell you, first of all, Dave, Dave, it's a real pleasure meeting you here uh, this evening. Uh, although I didn't play in that game, I did have the opportunity to watch it uh, back in the day. And, you know, it brings back so many great memories, as you guys alluded to earlier in the show. The tradition, the rivalry, the backyard brawl. I mean, college football just does not get any better than that from a traditional perspective. And I can remember... Uh, when I first met Bob Zatelli, and uh, good, to, good to hear from me again this evening, Bob, as well. Uh, but Bob started telling me about this big 33 Western Pennsylvania Athletic Conference. I'm not sure I had the terminology exactly right there, but the, the proving ground from which a number of players came out of from both Pitt and West Virginia. And uh, as Greg alluded to, you know, we're, we're all people from the same region of the country and we have the same values. You know, the tradition of, of, of Eastern football, the fact that Syracuse beats Penn State and Pitt that year, and then we turn around and beat Syracuse in the last game of the season. I mean, the tradition of, of Saturday afternoons just, for me, doesn't get any, any better than that. It's a real honor to meet you this evening, Dave. And uh, uh, I had a couple of questions for you uh, as I watched that game film. You know, that first uh, two-point conversion that you went for in the game to make it uh, 35 to, to 8, uh, you you took the ball in yourself, if I recall correctly, right, on a quarterback? Uh, yeah, it was in the first half, Mick. Yeah, I think, yeah, that was the first score, yeah. Yeah, and you barely got in the end zone, as I recall, right? It was like uh, a step know, or two? Yeah, you know, I was never that fast, so that's not a problem. <laughs> but I, I got – banged up a couple games before that. I missed the previous game, but I got, I was playing like with a bruised sciatic, which I can point yeah. to right now because it still hurts. But <laughs> I had a, a, like almost a, I guess an early flak jacket on, you know, okay. and so I really wasn't mobile, but I don't think it'll slow me down that much. But yeah, I remember just getting in, you know, 
but I got it. You know, it's like, yeah. you got it in, you got, you got it in. in. That's an important thing. And I Most think, agree. you know, that, that one play plus the play where you guys went for the first down at about the 11 yard line late in the game and barely got it by half of football. Yeah. I mean, those two plays to me, you know, you hear that phrase, football's a game of inches. Yeah. That's and, you know, it certainly is. Those two plays are very, very indicative of it. Uh, you know, Bobby, the swing. You know, Bobby, you'll know who, who that is. Bobby, that was Spats. Remember that? That Tony Esposito, another guy from the Rocks, a high school teammate of, of, of Bobby's. Was our All right. Back. And I remember we just running a real quick little fullback slip penetration in the A gap between the guard, the left guard and the center. And Spats made a move before I gave him the ball. It, that and that was like it was a, you know a remarkable for a guy who's six two about two twenty to have that yeah. kind of dexterity. But that was like it, and I thought about that a couple times. That you know he's this far away from you know not getting a fourth down, but he made this incredible move before he got the football to beat that guy who who beat us through the a gap. So it's stuff like that happened, Mick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it all comes down to uh, the play on the field. But I, yeah, I just hope that we get the the Pitt WV rivalry instilled in the future the way it was in the past. Uh, but I like to see it every year, man. It's just not a better game when it comes down. You know, down here in the Southeastern Conference where I live in the Atlanta area, you know, you got your uh, Alabama, Auburn, you got your Georgia, Georgia Tech. Uh, Arkansas, Texas, of course, that rivalry would be gone, the breakup of the uh, Texas and Oklahoma lead in the Big 12. But there's just nothing that approaches it in mm-hmm. terms of tradition. As Frank often says, we stand on the shoulders of others. And uh, what a great memory to go back and look at that and, and just what what a game. Yeah. And, you know, I think it shows you one thing in life, just to sum up here, is, you know, you may think you know how things are going to turn out in life, but I think football is a good indicator that oftentimes when you see the handwriting on the wall, it doesn't quite turn out the way you thought it was going to. Yeah. Very well stated, Mickey. Bob, get you in on this too. Uh, the emotions of speak to the emotions of the game from your perspective. Well, I think it's, you know, the competitive athletes, you know, you, you have the highs to the highs, the lows to the lows. Um, and, Everything in, and everything in between. Um, myself, I, I just remember when we were getting ready to play uh, the freshman game up at Aliquippa, right in the heart of the Golden Panther territory there at Beaver County. And uh, my God, I hope you remember this, the bus broke down on our way up about 15 miles out of Morgantown. And uh, we had to wait uh, for them to send a second bus to us to get us up to Aliquippa. And that game was a nightmare. I um, mean, you talk about rear end whipping, that the Panthers sure, surely put it us put us um, at a, a great disadvantage that game. We couldn't get anything started. They they, they did a job on us. Um, kudos, kudos to the Panthers that night. So I had a burning desire to get back to um, and the time came when we went up there um, our senior year, um, you know, for, for, for payback. We were sky high. The whole game, second half, was the exact opposite. Um, you know, my my very good friend Dave engineered a great, great comeback. Uh, we refer to Dave as a comeback kid back here in Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> and the, the, the emotions... Uh, you're going from one extreme to the other. Um, could have heard a pin drop on a bus on the way back home. And uh, who the hell wanted to eat a ham sandwich and a chocolate chip cookie on the way back? You know, we just had to look. And we still live with it. Um, in my conversation with Dave, we were talking, uh, I don't know, about a month or so ago. And I said, Dave, I said, please, a lot of people at our uh, – Scholarship luncheon are going to hear about that 36 35 game. So there was a, a very short moment of silence. And then Dave, that prankster that he is, he said, Bob, are you sure you want to relive that again? I said, no, please do. I need humble the bit. So um, I, I'm sure there's going to be a, uh, uh, a great interest in uh, reliving that ball game uh, from Dave's perspective. Um, I think. You know, the Duke game, I might alluded to the Duke game. Um, 
war was what, 21, 13? Just, we couldn't get anything going. Um, and it was a homecoming game of all things. And um, so that kind of put us in a, uh, you know, in a psychological, well, what are we going to do next week? We're going up to Pitt. But uh, we went into it with a great attitude. Um, Coach Biden was able to rally us um, after the uh, Penn State game. I remember the conversation in the locker room telling us, look, you got you got five games left to do something for yourselves and let's get on track and do what we have to do. Um, finish the season. At, uh, once again, I believe it was 8-3, hoping to go back to Atlanta for the Peach Bowl, but that never happened, uh, even though we were – um, in contention for uh, a few other games. And remember, there just weren't that many bowl games uh, back in that. And so it was an honor. Um, emotionally, myself, uh, you know, playing for West Virginia University, you know, you have your teammates and you have your people on campus, and Dave knows it and Mike knows it. They said, you're, you're, pay- you're playing – for the whole state you're playing for the whole university and your performance is a reflection um of of what you put into it and you only get out of it what you do put into it so you know each and every day of practice every game um you know but just it's kind of unusual but unless you go through it you're not really paying attention to what's happening in the stand your focus is on you know, what the play call is and what, what it is at that moment. Um, Dave and Mike, both being, both being collegiate coaches, know that, um, you know, their, the coach's goal is to uh, train and, and have your players. Uh, the question is, you know, how will they react in the face of adversity? How are they going to raise – how are they going to raise the occasion of, uh, of coming back? How are you going to perform under stress? So, um, you know, we've we've seen that time and time again. And, uh, you know, my, my respect for Dave is great. And, you know, David growing up and watching him play through Montour High School and University of Pittsburgh, Dave was that, was that individual, whether it was baseball, basketball, or football, he was going to be that guy. It might have been the touchdown pass. It might have been the base hit to win the baseball game. It might have been the steal and making a layup to win the ball game. But, you know, that's, David was a, a pack of dynamite, and he was going to make the big play. It's just that matter of when it was going to happen. But the second half of the pit game, it happened play after play after play after play. I think we had the ball maybe 12 or 15 plays. Um, the whole second half. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out uh, if Sindrich hit me harder or Lloyd Weston hit me harder. I don't know. You know my bones are still aching. Uh, yeah. You know, I shouldn't like Bobby Zatelli. Yeah, you know, at all. He, 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 we were, we were, we were, we grew up together. He grew up in the McKees Rostow, and I grew up in Kennedy Township part of Montour. But, we played against other. I think Bobby, you were a Dodger, and I was a Senator in a little league. And then we played against each other in Pony League. And then he mm-hmm. played at Stowe Rocks. Their combination of Stowe and McKees Rocks, great rivalry. Our senior year, he kicks our butt all over the field. It was a horrible loss, worst loss I've ever had in my life yeah. at Montour. And then he goes to West Virginia. So there's like, and then to the cherry on the, on the Sunday is he marries one of the prettiest girls out of my high school, Nancy. <laughs> so there's no reason I should like this guy, but he's such a <laughs> damn good guy. You guys love him. So, so. Hey. That's right. Oh boy. Make sure you tell Nancy I, I said that too, Bobby. <laughs> I will do that. I will do that. I, you know, like you said, we, we, talk, we, we talk about the high rivalry in a championship game, uh, Montour Stowe Rocks, and um, Dave had the long rock across the field. We met each other and embraced each other, you know, and uh, wished each other luck. And then um, I had to do the uh, twice to David after the freshman game when they kicked our ends. 
And then I had a very, very long walk trying to get across the field up at Pitt Stadium in that 36-35 yeah. game. But, um, you know, our relationship has been um, – very, very close for uh, oh man, maybe 65 years. Well, that's a long I was time very, time. very fortunate to hook up with my with my roommate Mike Sherwood uh, from Bel Air, Ohio. Uh, our, uh, my claim to fame is Mike and I were the only two in a room together for four years. So uh, that is a great respect. And you know, I, I, I did a lot of bootlegging and a lot of trap for for Mike on his calls. But there's only one other guy that would have I would have I would have loved to pull off one on a bootleg, and that would be my man Dave Haver. But um, our paths look our paths look different across. So I'd have loved to pull off for a bootleg on that guy. Well, but, that's um, nice you to say. You know that ain't going to happen anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got a fourth quarter yeah. left. Jim. I might be a little slower, but I'm. Yeah, hey, Mickey, we, we're, we're observers to a love affair here, I think. Between, <laughs> think yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, no, it's athletic, athletic respect. And by the way, yeah. before I'm going to turn to turn to you, uh, Dave and Mickey, for final comments. But uh, my mind's working a little bit slowly today. We were talking, uh, Dave and I, about that uh, before the show on that that Duke game. And uh, one of the reasons West Virginia got thrown a curve on that 1970 Duke game is. The quarterback for Duke, Leon Hart, Leon Hart. was Thank leading you. the country. Uh, in passing, and Duke came into uh, Mountaineer Field and ran the hell out of the ball. And uh, West, it was really a prelude of what was going to happen in Pitt the next week. The difference was, well, it really wasn't a difference. Duke beat West Virginia by just running the ball, short gains, mm -hmm. but persistently short gains. And then it carried over the next week. But anyway, uh, Dave, let me turn to you for final comments. Dave, it really was an honor and a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Uh, no, nah, Frank, I enjoyed the hell out of it. It's, it was good to meet Mickey and, and Daryl and those guys, and, of course, be on with Bobby and, and Mike Sherwood, who, God, who I've had immense respect and uh, hadn't had a chance to, to meet. But it seems like there's so many, you know, just so many intertwining relationships in this rivalry, and uh, it was kind of cool to be a part of it. I mean, obviously, here we are, 52, whatever it is, years later, still talking about it. So it's something that was uh, certainly near and dear to us. Uh, I think being Western Pennsylvania guys, I think that's an important thing. I think we can't lose, you know, lose sight of that. But unfortunately, it, it's always about the money. And so until somebody comes up with some way, it's like what happened to the old Steel Bowl in basketball. That was a great weekend, you know, where the heck's that anymore, you know? So anyway, I, I appreciate you guys doing this show. Uh, we have great respect for the Mountaineers. It is a, a, not a friendly rivalry, but it's a respectful rivalry. I'm not going to lie to you, you know that. But uh, but it was a pleasure being on with you guys and meet you guys. Uh, I, I appreciate your hospitality and and you putting up with my ramblings. Oh, no, no ramblings at all. Mickey, <laughs> final word from you, and then we'll uh, we'll end it for tonight. Well, in the interest of time here, I think I pretty much got my, my uh, two cents worth in here. Dave, again, pleasure meeting you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's always great to know the people that you competed with and, and the people you competed against. And uh, we're all cut from the same ilk. And uh, yeah. just hope the tradition can continue in the future of the backyard brawl. Ain't nothing like it anywhere. Yeah, it is. yeah we may be. I'll make a bet on going back to the future where uh, this, rather than continuing to expand with ever larger conferences, I think we're going to see some subdivisions and it's going to be regional. I think you're going to see Virginia Tech, Pitt, Syracuse, uh, you know, the Mountaineers, all those teams, I think probably playing again. This is, this is getting crazy with, uh, you know, with Washington in the Big Ten and uh, West Virginia having to go to, to Stillwater, Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, I think sometimes sanity takes a while, but we sort of catch ourselves before we really go over the cliff. But Dave's right. It, the money's got to be there, and uh, I think it will be. Well, thanks, everybody, for hanging with us, uh, but also those that are going to watch uh, archive version. Uh, Labor of love tonight. You take care. We're going to be with back with you. Uh, uh, we're going to be back with you next week. And as we said earlier, we're going to be focusing on basketball now that the season's over, looking at the Gale Catlett uh, era uh, for Greg Christ, who couldn't be here tonight. And by the way, happy birthday to Dave Gorby, his sidekick. 
on his uh, Thursday night show. This is Frank Fear for Mickey and Dave and Bob. Thanks for being here. Take care, everybody.